Hi, I'm Mitchell Strapinchik with Chicago Media Action, Chicago Indie Media, WLUW and WHPK Radio. Realize when watching Fox that there is a concerted effort to affect not only this, what is being said, but how it is being presented. Admittedly, this is par for the course across all media. I mean, I actually helped to produce a television show and a radio program myself, and I'll plainly admit to doing that myself. But at least for my own purposes, I'm not, I'm trying to be as honest as I can about my own biases and perspectives. Um, in the case of Fox, they are far guilty of hiding those things to present what is they would claim to be objective, fair and balanced, is not. And so some things have to be watched for. Some, some of the specific things to be watched for are um, is the use of fear as a tactic of uh, ginning up coverage. Um, and especially during the Obama administration, this has been a very commonly used um, approach where the given... Uh, a given story or given development regarding um, uh, uh, Obama's campaign or ge Obama's presidency um, is tied or potentially could be tied to some um, uh, radical activist from the 1960s that few people have heard of. Um, for a time, the name Francis Fox Piven was actually tossed around and was a, um, a pretty serious um, touted as like the next coming of Stalin or something. Frances Fox Piven is a sociology professor in New York City. She's actually been retired for years. She's 80 years old. She um, has written a number of books. Mostly in the last few years, she's written a lot about the democratic process vis-a-vis -vis voting. And yet they, they're kind of talking about her as um, a kind of... Well, admittedly, she's been very progressive and left in terms of her politics goes. But they've been touting her as a kind of monster that has to be avoided if you happen to run, to, run into her on the street. Um, even though she's far from it. So that's one example of the kind of fear that's been used to engender um, uh, that kind of uh, um, ginning up of stories and effects. Um, another one is just plainly out smearing um, people who have good names who can't be sullied otherwise and just regarding them as um, uh, monsters or as something they have to be avoided. Francis Fox Piven actually happens to come up as an example in the same approach. Not only is there that ginning up of fear, but there also happens to be a smear campaign against Francis Fox Piven, who, in reports she has made, since she's basically been made a boogeyman of, she's been reported that she's received um, defamatory emails and death threats. Um, and obviously for something that her political involvement admittedly has been muted in recent years, but that's understandable. Um, but nonetheless, she's suddenly brought out of um, obscurity and into the, limelight, li into the limelight, but not necessarily in a good way. You also find the examples of um, uh, the omission of certain inconvenient facts. Um, here's a classic example about this, and it's not just Fox that's actually guilty of this. In 2009, the New York Times had a, an expose, front page story, on, and you may tout this, tout this as an example of liberal media bias, but hear me out. There was a huge story about conflicts of interest involving military commentators. Um, when people who are brought on to talk about war are brought on cable news channels like Fox and others, they tend to be uh, usually retired military personnel, generals and so forth. What, my, what, what was not discovered until this expose followed the threads and presented it all in a single clear article was that those retired generals who were analyzing war also had a direct conflict of interest regarding those wars because they held stock or other financial ties to the companies that wound up profiting from war. And supposedly they're deemed as neutral commentators and this conflict of interest was never disclosed. And they hadn't been disclosed until this expose came out. This was a pretty serious deal, especially since it was a front page Sunday New York Times story um, that wound up not only shaping up a little bit of the, the uh, um, criticism regarding media, the story itself wound up winning a Pulitzer Prize, which, oddly enough, actually didn't see very much coverage subsequent. CNN, for example, in their coverage of the 2010 Pulitzer Prizes, even though they reviewed a number of journalism prizes, and this may have been one of the bigger ones that came out, they never, they never reported this. And this was actually commented on by people in the blogosphere. as like, wait a minute, there's this huge story that you didn't report about for tremendous conflicts of interest. But this is an example about how Fox will 
not talk about something that you figure you should know something about, especially where you may want to, you may be relying on what's being said as your basis of information for trying to form an opinion of your own. If there's a conflict of interest there, obviously you'd want to know about it. In certain peer-reviewed medical journals, for example, if there is a conflict of interest there, it is the policy of those journals, a lot of the times, especially if they're of serious scientific nature, to require those disclosures. Because, obviously, the research or the perspectives that might be voiced might be tainted in one or another way. Obviously, that information is not the kind of thing that you can necessarily watch for. You've got to try to explore that by other means. The Internet Accords an excellent example about doing this. There are now a lot of websites. Um, Media Matters for America is one. Uh, the Sourcepedia, run by the Center for Media and Democracy, is another. Um, sometimes even Wikipedia can will sometimes find uh, information about this, about things like this that wind up proving to be useful disclosures. Unfortunately, it's not the kind of thing you can necessarily solve by just watching or watching something else. Uh, some additional work has to be done. But luckily, it's of a nature that you don't have to do a whole lot of additional work, especially given the resource like Google, where a lot of this kind of research is readily available. Of course, then that means, well, a lot of untruths and things that aren't sourced or not facts um, are not on the Internet, or are on the Internet, and might be muddying off the waters. Well, that's obviously true. That doesn't mean that everything on the Internet should be taken as gospel. Far from it. That's the kind of thing that uh, a critical perspective and um, a due diligence regarding the integrity of information and what is said has to be um, uh, vetted for and brought to bear. And that, because that's not something that's necessarily easily done. You may find one or more sources that you may rely on for groups and resources that do this kind of work to help to reduce that leverage. I myself rely on resources like this, like Sourcepedia, like Media Matters, like um, Talking Points Memo, like Raw Story, like Indie Media from time to time, um, where they do this due diligence to, to help to reduce the amount of workload for people.